it live and I see a recording. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. My name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids, and I'm super excited about hosting this particular session um, because this amazing woman um, I met over a decade ago, over 10 years ago, and have gotten to do some amazing projects. I know, right? Uh, uh, amazing projects, and she's really been an inspiration, a mentor, and a friend. So uh, I think you're really going to enjoy uh, this story. But our our guest today is Christina Zanato. Um, I think the most incredible thing is in this day and age, you're still an explorer, um, which is really, really incredible. Um, not only exploring cave systems, which is amazing, but also the world of sharks and their behavior. Um, and Christina has been a professional diver since 1994 and has done, wears a lot of hats, um, even just underwater, but also started her own nonprofit organization called the People of, Wa of the Water, and which you can check out after. We'll make sure you guys have links to check out the work because you're gonna wanna stay on I keep up with the, the work that this amazing woman is doing. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to let you take over and talk to us about your work with these incredible sharks. All right. Thank you, Jillian. Um, by the way, it's over 15 years. Oh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe over 15 years. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> but it's amazing. Even more amazing then. <laughs> Welcome everybody and thank you for being here. Uh, today what I'm going to be talking about uh, primarily is uh, shark tourism in the Bahamas. So not specifically just about my work, actually it's very little about my work, but like how shark tourism has benefited the sharks in the Bahamas and in a model that could also be repeated in different parts of the world and has already been repeated in different parts of the world. We're also going to look into a little bit uh, what uh, favor this and what are the opportunities and maybe spark some ideas in other people. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and start with my slideshow. I have been working in the um, diving industry for 26 years. So I've been working with sharks for 26 years and primarily been working with Caribbean reef sharks and nurse sharks in the Bahamas. Um, I'm based on the island of Grand Bahama Island, but I also travel through the world to uh, meet and dive with different species of sharks, but also meet people that work with sharks and understand what they were doing and how they were doing in order to be able to create encounters that were safer for not only the sharks, but also the viewers and also for ourselves. Uh, that said, the Bahamas is a 470,000 square kilometers, 180,000 square miles between land and the ocean. But if you look at the little red areas, you will see that of land, there's not too much compared to what is the ocean. So we are a water country and a beautiful water country, one of the most spectacular countries actually uh, ever observed from the satellite. The things are beautiful, shallow and clear water. And with all the water comes the coral reefs and obviously quite a healthy environment uh, for sharks and all sorts of animals. But we're made of what it's called limestone rocks. So we're made of a terrain that is not so agriculturally friendly. It tends to be a terrain that basically has not much on top of it in form of a, a land is very hard to create like a healthy agriculture and it's a very harsh terrain and one of the things that happens is excuse me um when it rains the water sits on the ground for a little bit and then disappears below ground and this is tradition the landscape that you're going to see on on many of our islands which is a palmetto fronds some harsh uh, vines and then there's uh, in some of the islands there's uh, some of the pine tree forests. So, so it's a country that always struggle with creating agriculture and um, where does the water go is underground and like uh, Jillian said I am a cave explorer and a cave diver and so underneath uh, this dry land, there's actually quite a lot of water, but it doesn't really benefit from an agriculture point of view. So it's a very hard industry to develop in the Bahamas. 
Uh, we also have to deal with something that maybe quite a lot of people are familiar with, which is a very harsh weather. We have unfortunately been hit through the years by quite a lot of major storms, which uh, damage all these attempts to create maybe a more stable agriculture industry. So what brings into the, uh, Baham the Bahamas primarily is uh, tourism and finances, and then commercial and sport fishing. So tourism, uh, this is a regular day pictures of one of our beaches. It, the tourism is attracted to the beauty of our islands. And this is really like a day-to-day -day view that you can have on most of our islands. So we have people that come on the island to uh, relax and uh, to party. Uh, we have people that come to do all sorts of different water sports. That could be the banana boat or sailing or jet skiing. Uh, we also have uh, people here as a special tourism come to uh, uh, become married to have their wedding done in these unique settings. And uh, part of our tourism is created also by obviously a lot of boating industry. Uh, the fishing industry is, is a very strong one and uh, it covers uh, what we call a recreational fishing. So people that come here for sport fishing, which could be uh, the bone fish in the shallow waters or uh, the deep water with deep sea fishing or groupers or anything like that. And you may be wondering why I'm talking about all of this about the sharks, but we'll, we'll get there. And just to give you an idea of how the economy of the Bahamas work, how you know finances, tourism and fishing are so important and how shark center. And then we have uh, Bahamian uh, local fishing, primarily uh, Bahamians fish on grouper, uh, they have a stone crab, lobster, and then the very famous one that is uh, the conch industry that not only fuels the Bahamian um, islands, but also is exported. Luckily, we have a very healthy shark population. And how is that? Um, the Bahamas, since the 1990s, actually did something absolutely spectacular. They banned what it's called drift nets. The drift nets are miles long nets, basically scoop everything and anything that comes in their path. They're dragged behind the boat and they created basically a trap for anything that is comes into their content, creating quite a lot of waste in the fishing method and creating quite a lot, unfortunate of losses of life uh, during to animals that are trapped that can escape, maybe drown or suffocate. And then they are not used for food and so they're discarded. And the other one that they eliminated back in 1993 was what it's called a long lining. Long lining is considered one of the most destructive uh, fishing methods that we have. It's sometimes miles and miles of fishing lines are marked by these float balls with flags. And then underneath there's hooks and these hooks um, attract any kind of prey. So it's pretty indiscriminately fishing anything out there, causing quite a lot of loss of damage in any kind of population, not only the sharks, but also all the other fish. The sharks is one of the ones that have been affected the most. Um, luckily also, sharks are not really very much on our menu or on the Bahamian menu. So they have never really been targeted. And that's the reason why we have this very healthy population. So how did shark tourism started? Or what is a shark tourism? We define shark tourism primarily by which people that intentionally go somewhere to observe sharks in the different methods that I'm going to uh, describe, either through provisioning the animals, so, so there's any sorts of hand feeding, pole feeding, chumming, chumsicle, anything like that, throwing food overboard, like in case of the glass bottom boat, or locating where the sharks congregate and basically find their natural feeding grounds. But that is considered all shark tourism. Some of it is uh, dry. You can be uh, as young as you want and be on a glass bottom boat and they'll bring you over the sites where there are sharks. There's two glass bottom boats just here in Freeport where I'm from. And you can see the sharks are swimming underneath the glass of the boat. So people that don't have the capability of scuba diving or swimming can just see sharks on any sites where there's already maybe a feeding going on. 
A different kind of um, shark tourism is also snorkeling, depending on the species of sharks. Right now we're looking at the nurse sharks in the islands of Exumas. So people of any age that are capable of float and swim can enter the water and snorkel with uh, what are considered a little bit of a tame shark. Um, still an animal, so uh, interactions is, has to be done safely, but you can basically jump in the water and snorkel with them at any given time. So a lot of people come to swim with the nurse sharks. We then have um, different species of sharks. The number one that brings in 99% of the income for the Bahamas is the Caribbean reef shark. Uh, the Caribbean reef shark is uh, a species very abundant, is near threatened. So by definition is actually not doing too bad. And people hand feed the Caribbean reef sharks while scuba diving sit down on the ocean floor and watch the interaction. And the sharks swim over the divers, around the divers, and have absolutely no interest in the divers. Here we go. And they only have interest in, into the feeder doing the interaction with the animals. The advantage of the Caribbean reef sharks is they're not seasonal. So you actually have Caribbean reef shark in the Bahamas year round. So it's easier to have tourism coming in for Caribbean reef sharks for that reason. But then we have three species that are absolutely um, unique and they actually belong to specific islands and specific seasons, but they're being defined are the three shark species that are quite, excuse me, attract quite a lot of tourism. We have the oceanic white tip from the island of Cat Island. This is a critically endangered species. This list is critically endangered. It's one step before becoming extinct in the wild. And people come from all over the world to enjoy time shared in the water with the oceanic white tip. So that is a very specific industry that we have here. Together with the Bimini hammerheads, the hammerheads as well are critically, the great hammerhead is critically endangered, one step before being extinct in a while. And they congregate in the islands of Bimini in the winter time. There is a feeding going on. This is a feeder, Neil Watson. These are images taken on a regular dive. And again, the, the viewer can kneel down on the ocean floor and have these majestic creatures just swim inches from them and take pictures and interact and just watch the people interacting with them. So very much a part of our shark diving industry together with uh, the famous, maybe the most famous uh, Tiger Beach, uh, where divers again, this is again Neil Watson from Bimini Scuba Center, can actually have 14 foot tiger sharks and other sharks, lemon sharks and bull sharks and Caribbean reef sharks just swim inches from their heads and not only learn something maybe that they didn't expect but our sharks, which is the sharks know the difference between the feeder and the people that are watching. Uh, the sharks are not mindless eating machines. The sharks have no interest whatsoever in these people watching. They're just interested in the bait that the person is taking. But this also creates ambassadors, creates people that have an interest in sharks and they want to know more. And once they want to know more and they learn more, they can also share more with other people and can bring back true information. So they can go out there and tell people, hey, no, it's not true this about the tiger sharks. I was in the water with them and they didn't even pay attention to me. So these are four species of sharks specifically bring in quite a lot of income. What does it mean? It means that for the industry to develop, we need to create local people that can actually work in the diving industry. But then these people expand and not only are become diving instructors and dive masters and boat captains, but many of them, and Jillian can tell you this even better than I do, proceed into all different kinds of schoolings. They become marine biologists and they become, they start working for the Bahama National Trust and they start educating and they start basically understanding the entire value of having sharks in the environment, which brings us back to the beginning of, our, of this conversation and why I said the different industries and how shark tourism helped the Bahamas is 
sharks maintain a healthy ecosystems. They're very much necessary at all levels of the food web. They are apex predator, they're mesoteric feeders, they basically feed on fish, they're fed on by bigger sharks, and they where they're sharks, there's usually the best of fish and fish population. So some of the studies that have been done uh, back in 2014-15 um, resulted in some of these numbers. Sharks and shark tourism. So specifically, again, people that are coming to see sharks and be in contact with them bring a total of $113.8 million to the country, which then are reinvested in what we just did. Right. But not only that, they of that is hundred million point hundred nine million is in diving. We then have research. A lot of researchers come to the Bahamas to learn more about sharks and gather more information. And then filming, creating documentary and all of that. And this is only when you ask specifically about sharks, but imagine everything that goes around that the family that travels with the diver, the souvenirs that they buy, the, the food that they try, the taxi driver that they use. So the Bahamas have recognized that the input of a live shark is way more valuable than a dead shark. And so all the sharks dives that you saw are actually legal in the Bahamas. Nothing is done illegally. This is all approved. And, and the operators self patrol through rules and regulations that they come up with to guarantee the safety of the divers and the safety of the crew and also the safety of the viewer. And what the, the, uh, that did is actually allow the Bahama National Trust together with the Pew Organization in 2011 to push for something extraordinary. The Bahamas became a national shark sanctuary so sharks within this sanctuary are not to be killed, uh, taken out of the water. Uh, you can bring in any parts, you can import or export. And that is one of the most fantastic things about this shark tourism. The government recognized that it's actually best to take people to go diving with these animals and enjoy the time with them than to kill them because one time kill bringing way less business than a lifetime of being able to interact and dive with them. And that's how sharks, shark tourism saves sharks in the Bahamas. So I know it's a short presentation. It was just to give you an idea about how our country works and lives and why sharks are so important. And I'm gonna stop sharing and go back to video and see if there are any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. And I think it's it's really important because people are joining us from around the world and, and you hear about the Bahamas, you see the Bahamas. If you guys have ever watched a Shark Week show, a shark show on BBC, Animal Planet, Discovery Channel, National Geographic, you've probably seen the Bahamas. Um, we're really lucky. It's crystal clear water. You probably noticed in, in Christina's photos very clear water, uh, very beautiful, um, and very, very easy to access sharks. Um, we're really lucky. We have them in our backyards. We can go see them. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a special place. And I think what Christina highlighted is that this is setting a model for around the world from research, diving, conservation, education. Um, it's really come together and brought the community together to kind of highlight these animals and just show how important they are on a lot of different levels. So um, yeah, so hopefully you guys now, you know, can understand a little bit of what has, that's where that's come from and, and how it developed over time because it's definitely changed over time and new sites. And um, I'm always wondering what's the next shark diving site gonna be? It's uh, what are we gonna have? Um, so, all right, well, the first question I like to ask, but we have several on here is, do you have a favorite shark and what is it? Which is probably, a, it's always a tough one, I think for people. It's always, it's a, it's a, I think the number one question I receive 
uh, of the of the positive one, you know, not this I'm scared of sharks, but the Caribbean reef sharks, because I've been working with them personally for about 26 years. So I'm in the water with them several hours per day. I have my group that I've come to learn. I named them. They have personalities. It's kind of like going and visiting my puppy. So if somebody said, what is your favorite dog? I would have to say my two puppies. Then I love all the dogs and I'll help all of them. But uh, primarily the Caribbean reef sharks because of that connection that I have. My second favorite, and it usually surprises people, I have a little soft spot for the blue shark. Um, and it's just absolutely the colors and the little dab of gold and just the elegance that it has through the water. There's no sharks that when I see, I don't go crazy about. I mean, on, on the side, we also have quite a lot of nurse sharks. And the more you work with them, the more you realize how intelligent they are. And they, how they're capable of making connectivity and actually they can learn and just, you know, and then they can remember, which is even more incredible, so. Yeah, and for you guys watching, if you check out and you just, you can go on YouTube and see some videos of Christina interacting with the sharks and I've been lucky enough to see her in action and these animals do recognize people, they do. They're far more intelligent than people give them credit for, um, not even just, you know, in the, like, think about, they've been trained to push buttons, open boxes, they learn very quickly. Um, the hammerheads in Bimini, where I live, definitely recognize specific feeder boxes, specific divers boats, um, and you see their personalities. And so if you watch some of the footage um, that Christina has, you'll see that, you'll see those interactions, that connection, which is really, really special. And I think surprises people because of, you mentioned it, this mindless eating machine, you know, it's not, that's not what they are at all. And the more people see the photos and videos and people interacting with them, and in your case, it's a very special bond. Um, yeah, I think it's really important for people to see that. And when people come to the Bahamas, they see that. And, uh, and then they take that back to where they're from and they talk about it. So if any of you guys watching have dived with sharks, swam with sharks, or I see a lot of people who say they really want to, which is great, do it and share it with other people. Um, maybe you'll get a chance to dive with Christina. Maybe some of you have already dived with her, but share that experience and talk about it because the more people that understand how important and amazing they are, the better their chances of, of surviving, particularly species that she mentioned that are critically endangered. So and, you know, what Jillian said, I mean, they're actually very accessible. There's some dives that even a, a 10 year old certified diver could do because the dive site is so shallow. They have to be still good divers, they have to be chaperoned, but there's actually dives that they can access even if you're a 10 year old certified scuba diver, you can go diving with sharks here in the Bahamas because that's how accessible they are. All right, so um, Nikki asked, um, she's obviously, or he or she, sorry if I'm, it's uh, just spelling, I'm not sure, uh, has um, asked, obviously seeing you remove hooks from these sharks. Uh, how many sharks have you saved from hooks? Um, so you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. So I've been removing hooks for uh, for many years. So some people ask me when, and I can remember when I made the connection between seeing a shark with a hook and wanting to remove a hook. I sure know that the presence of hook has increased through the years. I haven't saved maybe that many sharks, but I have removed over 300 hooks. And what it means is I tend to have some of my sharks sometimes that show up with hooks on a repetitive basis. So imagine if the sharks that didn't remove the hook, then it will have the next one and the next one and the next one. So I have sharks that have removed me, you know, sometimes four or five hooks, 10 hooks. And I'm thinking, are you done? But it's really funny because when I see, and there's primarily a certain group of sharks that have the, the hooks, I actually do realize I'm thinking, this must be the strongest one of the pack because it's one that gets to the fish the fastest and the soonest. That's the reason why it becomes hooked. So it's actually interesting to see the sharks are, have more hooks than others. The other thing that is interesting is as I remove hooks from my known sharks, other sharks that I've never seen before so start showing up on the outer skirts of my action. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remove a hook from one of my sharks. All of a sudden I can see a shark and as I recognize them, I'm like, oh, that's a new shark. And they show up with these hooks. It takes a while to convince them to come in, to trust me, to allow me to touch them. Sometimes it takes dozens of dives for a new shark just to do it. But I actually had new sharks showing up and then staying in the territory after I removed the hooks. That's amazing. And it's just, you know, it, it's, 
watching their behavior and someone who spent as much time with them, it's, you really do start to see that. And, and that's again, incredible and incredible to share. Um, so kind of leads into this question, Kiefer, who's been joining us for a lot of these webinars. So welcome back. Uh, what is the most exciting moment you've had with sharks in the Bahamas? Because obviously you've traveled the world, but what about in the Bahamas? What's the most exciting moment for you? I think the most exciting moment, which is one that luckily repeats itself almost every dive, is the first time a shark came and laid in my lap. And um, that she, it's a female, it's a female shark. She, come in, she came into kind of like my chest and stopped swimming. And because the sharks don't have a swimming bladder, she slowly sunk down to the ocean floor. So I sunk down with her and I was kneeling down. I had her body weighing it down on my legs. And at first they're a little bit like tense. And it's that moment when the shark completely relaxed and I could feel her weight just absolutely go clunk down on my legs and her breathing, her, her pumping, she, they start pumping water through their gills so through a system called buccal pumping, started to basically slow down and the entire fins basically slumped down in the sand. The first time it happened, it was uh, magic and it was unique and it was special because my mentor, Ben Rose was there and was looking at me. I'd been learning from him and I've been desperately wanting to have this connection with the sharks. And when he happened, I remember I was sitting there with the shark and I looked up and he was looking down at me with a nice nod of approval. And now I'm lucky enough because it's a special moment that happens every time. But the other one is, uh, I think the story of Foggy Eye. Foggy Eye was uh, one of those sharks that came on the dive, but didn't like to be pet. So I can't force my sharks to be pet. They either want to be pet or not. I can be within half an inch of their nose. And if they don't want to be pet, they just take a little twick and they're gone. And Jillian can tell you this because she did this with me. So she knows. But um, Foggy I liked to come on the dive. She took her fish and then she left. She didn't like to be pet. And then one day she showed up with a hook on the side of her mouth, which I removed as she was swimming by, nothing major. And then two days later, she showed up with another hook. But I couldn't see the hook. All I could see it was the wire coming out of her mouth. And I was able to coax it into coming. It took me about 30, 40 minutes. And every once in a while, I tried to open her jaw and look inside. And I could see the hook stuck right on the bottom of her, of her mouth. And in one of, I think, one of the most famous videos that went crazy, I literally stuck my hand in and pulled the hook out. And to me, that was the normal thing to do. But what was extraordinary is a foggy eye from that day on started to come in and ask me to pet her. So I will be standing there without even looking. I wouldn't even see her. She'll be coming from behind and lean into my shoulder and just slump down on the ground or lean into my leg. And I'll be turning around going, hey, hi. And um, she changed completely behavior from the day I removed that hook from her throat. Yeah, it's, it's again, it goes back to these animals are a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. and there is the ability to connect and and i think that's that's amazing and why is it any different with a shark than any other animal i mean you know it's it might not be your dog and cat at home i mean the thing is and i think you mentioned this these are still wild animals they absolutely like respect from start to finish when you're interacting with them which is I think why you've had so much success is is still remembering that and and for you guys who maybe aren't familiar Christina's also wearing a chainmail suit when she's doing this. I was just thinking of people are like the hands going, and she's got a full chainmail suit. Um, also highly trained, um, years and years of experience doing this and, and working with not just reef sharks, but particular individuals. Um, and somebody asked, which you just mentioned one, but Alina wanted to know if you've named any of the sharks and what are their names? So we obviously just heard about Foggy Eye, who's, who's clearly a, has been a favorite. What else? So I named the sharks um, in a way that should be easier for anyone that comes on the dive, even the first time on a glimpse to recognize about four or five of them, maybe not all of them. Um, because of that, I use a physical characteristics that are very blunt. So they don't really have, there's a couple of sharks that have a couple of girls names, but most sharks have names like hook or crook or scrunchy or stompy, by which then I've been banned from my friends to name their kids. But so, and the reason why is it's very simple. Is is nothing. It's not demeaning. But it, I have like it, it would be kind of like somebody saw me and then they said, "What's what's her name? His name? Oh, her name is Scar. She has a scar under her eye, right? So it's easier to recognize. So Hook Dorsal Fin has 
instead of being flat, is like this. It looks like a little hook. So anyone that I say the hook has a dorsal fin like this is, is the only shark that has the fin like this. It's easy to recognize. And then a crook has a little bit of a cricket fins, you know, the little bit bent. So I call her crook. So if I, if I give someone and say, hey, that shark is doing this, it's very easy for someone to connect. The, some names are a little bit different, like grandma, her name is like that because she's a big, light, light gray shark and very, very slow and gentle. So I call her grandma. And then a couple of them have a female name, have Liz. Her name is Liz because she has like a black dot right here, like a nice beauty mole like Liz Taylor used to have. I just aged myself. <laughs> but, you know, the beauty mole. And um, Scrunchy, for example, is a male and he has like a hole in his head, a hole in his head that basically healed and scrunched up his entire skin. So when you see it, it looks like it's all scrunched in instead of being nice and smooth. But that allows people to like, oh, I saw scrunchy or foggy eye has a completely blind black eye. Caribbean reef sharks have a cat eye, so they don't look like tiger. But foggy eye has one eye that looks like a tiger shark. So when you see a shark with a just black eye, that is a foggy eye. So that's how I came to name them. It's primarily physical characteristics and some appearances. And it's amazing too, because I, I see it in Bimini with the hammerheads named and people want to know. It's a little harder because they're Greek gods and goddesses and not named after uh, a feature. Uh, but yeah, people are like, they want to know, they get really excited. And again, it's it's taking that dive to another level and connecting one-on-one -on -one and treating them as individuals versus, oh, we, we swam with sharks. And uh, so yeah, I think it really highlights for people that these are unique animals, each one. And they do have person, I mean, just what you've talked about a little bit, it's clear that they have personalities and yeah. So I think it's it's always fun and I love it too. I mean, when we get to go dive and I saw Gaia today and Medusa or Scylla, who's my favorite animal, you know, it's it's fun to be able to to relate to that. So well, very so cool. Lorraine, so it, one of the things about sharks that sometimes I notice is uh, um, we tend just to, to group them and we forget they're actually uh, animals, right? One of the things is they're, all they want to do is live and let live in a certain way. Yes, they feed on fish or anything like that. And uh, uh, the other mistake that we do is sometimes we tend to compare them. Like I have questions like, oh, do sharks, the sharks don't do this like a dog or don't do this, they're going to do this like a bear. Or they're not a mammal, they're not a dog. So... Uh, maybe their level of interest and um, connection with me is different, but is the level of connection of interest that a shark can master. So I think as humans, we just need to accept a little bit that as animals, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Lorraine wants to know if there's a species of shark that you haven't worked with yet, but that you would like to and why? Question. What a nice question. Huh. Yeah. A very difficult one to answer, to work with. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to turn that one off. Uh, <laughs> um, right. If I say to be in the water with, I would love to spend some time in the water with a basking shark. That is something that I would like to really uh, spend some time in the water with. If, I, if it was a matter of working with, Ooh, that's, that's, that's a tough one. I, I would like actually to work and, and see a little bit more of the sedentary shark, you know, spend a little bit more time with the Wobbegon, for example, of the poor Jackson or the horn sharks and have more time in the water, which is totally different from my environment. They're cold water, they're primarily in California type of places, kelp and all that. But see a little bit how they work and interact and basically how they, and not specifically feed them because one of my biggest things is I don't believe in one, one size fits all. In the Bahamas, you'll see that every shark dive is done differently according to the species. The people are handled differently according to the animals and how we're feeding them. So, but yeah, I would like to work more with the kind of like uniquely shaped ones. Yeah, I think a basking shark would be just, you know, now and there seems like there's more options to get in the water with one. Um, yes. And yeah, they just would be incredible and worth the cold water, I think. So, um, all right. So Marley wants to know if there's a shark that you would recommend for someone for their first time shark dive, which is kind of, 
I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. Like, is it a snorkel? Is it a dive? Are you experienced? I mean, if you, you're probably thinking of all those things too as, as someone who's yes, taught for so long. All of that. So a generalized answer will be the one that comes to mind is a whale shark. Although the whale shark uh, requires for someone to be a very strong swimmer because they, when you looked at them on video, they look like they're like, ah, oh, moving, but one kick of their tail and they're like 20 feet away from you. So the whale shark from a, if you have a little bit of anxiety, because we know we're talking about sharks and yes, they're wild and some of them require a little bit more attention. The whale shark requires less of that. You're snorkeling, but you still have to be a strong swimmer. The next one will be the nurse shark because it doesn't require as a strong swimming, but it still requires attention and respect. They're not puppy dogs. So even if we're going to water with nurse sharks, you don't want to pull on their tail, grab on their dorsal fin or anything like that. Nurse sharks especially have very powerful vacuum mouth. They can actually suck a conch alive out of their shell. So you definitely want their mouth, your hand in their mouth. But those will be the two sharks that I would say across the board without asking any other questions you can e easily go in a water with, uh, or you can go with great whites in a cage. I mean, you don't even have to be scuba certified. You're on a surface, you're with a little surface supplied. It's a little bit of cold water, it's a little bit of rough water. So there's quite a lot of questions that I would ask someone, mm -hmm. you know, who are you? How old are you? Do you have certifications? You're not certified. Um, are you going with your kids? Are you going by yourself? All those things are in consideration. But yeah, those will be like, I guess the three ones. What do you think, Julian? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's, there's a lot of aspects that have to go into that. Um, and I think also to add is the dive operation, because as we know, operators run very differently. So diving with the same species with two different operators could be a very different experience. So, you know, I would just say for people is do your homework, do some research, don't be afraid to ask questions and be honest about your experience because you're gonna get the most out of it. Um, and, uh, and so I think, you know, those whale sharks, nurse sharks, great, um, you know, uh, intro sharks, I think again, you know, strong swimming, but yeah, I think the biggest thing is to kind of understand your level um, and do your homework. And that's for diving in general. I'm sure you would speak to it as well as you want to find out, um, you know, it's not just, is it going to be a cool dive? Is the operator respectful of the sharks as well? Uh, how they work with them, handle them. So there is, it's, it's not a, a simple um, answer. And a few of you asked how to dive with Christina. I've put the, the web link, the company name in. So um, I can highly recommend it uh, if you get a chance, because it is, it's incredible to see. It's just a beautiful dive in general. Um, but, and uh, the thing about diving in the Bahamas is you are, you know, this was your talk, you are supporting people, the community, the economy. Um, so your dive is a lot more than just a cool experience for you personally. It really benefits um, the Bahamas and places like Grand Bahama that did get hit by Dorian. Um, you know, supporting these islands is really, really important. So when we can all go back to traveling and, and doing this, um, yeah, spending some time. <laughs> we don't know when, but we will go back. Um, yeah, that your, your dives can be a lot more than just a simple, amazing experience for you. They can support a lot and, and we see that in the Bahamas. So um, we've had a lot of people ask, why sharks? All right, you were diving, but why sharks and why sharks for so long? Because you've obviously stuck with it. It was amazing. And you said, right, I'm going to keep doing this. Uh, why? Um, so what, the sharks, I grew up luckily in a family where um, the, the ocean was like our backyard, our playground. And um, family where mom and dad always taught me that sharks are animals and there are no monsters in the seas, only the one that we make up in our heads. So I grew up with a vision of a shark just being a creature, an animal. And I remember asking my dad, I said, oh, I'm gonna be able to see a shark and him being from the military and being in the ocean for many years, always said is it will be very lucky. It's very difficult to see a shark. So I grew up with this, luckily balanced outlook on sharks. But then I realized that it was an outlook that not many people have. A shark is being demonstrated to be the one of the words that triggers the scary, the, the most frightful reaction in people. They did a, actually a University of Yale did a study and they would say things like fire, 
you know, earthquake, shark. And the emotional response to the word shark was actually one of the worst. So I realized they needed maybe someone to help them. And because I love them so much, I also wanted people to understand why I love them so much and maybe why they should have learn if not to love them to appreciate them and to understand them and to accept them they've been here 400 million years you've been here 200,000 years i mean seriously uh this there's no comparison and that also tells you we're not on the shark menu but it was it was the reason why maybe i have a little bit of for the underdog you know um jillian too she we have in common sharks and love for pit bulls. <laughs> but it was just to show something different. But I think they're fundamental. So that's the reason why sharks. And why did I stick with it so long? Is they're they're my family. There I had people asking me, do you ever get bored to go down and do the same dive? And it's like, no, I never get bored to open the door and see my puppies wagging their tail and seeing me. I never, I'm never bored to take them for a walk or take them to the beach and watch them. So it's the same thing with sharks. I have this connection with them. It's it's not just a okay. I've been there, done that. Tick. I'll I'll I want to keep. I'm suffering right now. I can't go out in the ocean with the sharks. I know. I'm absolutely and devastated. I, and people probably ask you too. I mean, we get you know, I have friends. Oh, it's just another nurse shark. And I just always am. Anytime you're in the water. We can breathe underwater. We have equipment that allows us to be in the ocean. First off, that is incredible. Um, and second off is we're down there in this wild world and we're part of it for just a few minutes. And, and I honestly hope, you know, I wish for everybody to not feel like that. Oh, I took the box. Okay, cool. Is that appreciate that because it's so special. And yeah, it's, I hope that I never am like, oh, it's just an air shark. Um, and, uh, you know, there's definitely some dives with the hammerheads for maybe if less of them. <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 that's appreciation. And I think it's not just the sharks, it's the whole being in the ocean. Um, that's really, really special. So we're going to finish with one great question that I know this is probably helpful for a lot of people. But uh, Harshita said she recently read your article on the Siren Project, and she wants to know what advice that you would give for young explorers, and I would say probably people who are interested in maybe diving, doing this kind of work in general, uh, you know, caves, sharks, all of that. What, what advice would you offer? So uh, it is one of the questions that I receive a lot. How do I become you or how do I get to do what you do and it's it's a very tough one because I obviously don't have a direct answer um, the two things that uh, bring in common and you, you can see that just by having you know Jillian and myself here is one of the route we picked is to be where the sharks are um, so we live in the Bahamas and we live close to the sharks and then I went the route of the uh, diving professional which a lot forces me to do other jobs. I mean, I wish I could only be in the water with sharks. I actually have quite a lot of duties to do and other works to do. And then Jillian went the marine biology way in, in, a, different, in a different way. But at the end of the day, our road and our path crossed uh, with the same common thing. So it depends on what, what, what interests you the most. I had people say, well, I have to get into law and uh, environmental. I'm like, not necessarily. You can be the same scientists that bring up the data that then gives to the people to talk about the laws. That's what I do in cave diving. From a, a personal point of view is um, you need to put in, to find what makes your heart beat faster, what makes you wake up and be happy to do it. You need to understand there's a price to pay. There's always a price to pay. Um, and you need to make sure that the price you pay, there is the one that you're willing to pay. Right, you look at the price tag and you're like, yeah, I, I want to do this and I can afford this and this is really for me. And then that's what you do and you, you pick your choices. But then you need to put in time and patience. And uh, I always say when I talk about cave diving, but this applies to any, it takes a village to make, to make a diver, to make a cave diver. It takes a village to make someone. So go and learn from other people, take opportunities, volunteer, intern, learn other skills. Everything then comes in together. I am a diver, I'm a 
technicians, I'm a hydro person, I had to learn physiology, now I have to learn photography and Photoshop and Excel spreadsheets and how to send out my own thing. So remember, learn laterally, not only vertically. And in a certain way, don't learn trying to say, well, if I, if I do this, this is the immediate result I was. Maybe this is something that you just put in your back pocket. And then one day it just comes out and is gonna be uh, the most useful thing. And, and I use an example, one of the many examples happened to me through my life, which I'm gonna end up with that is basically follow your heart. And it comes with cave diving, uh, sharks, uh, sharks are, way beyond that, but cave diving. I love cave diving and I always put so much personal time into it. And through the years, I learned how to do the side mount then I learned how to do survey. Then I figured out there was this new survey method. So I went after that technology then I went after this technology and I learned, learned, learned and I spent all this money. And I was doing all this work till one day somebody turned around and said, hey, we need somebody that is expert in the caves in Abaco, my friend Brian Kakuk who works there. They need to be experts in the caves in Abaco, where I spent a lot of time and money to go and visit. They need to be expert in this kind of survey and they need to be this kind of cave diver. And I was like, tick, tick, tick. And I ended up on a net geo photo shoot exploring the caves in Abaco doing. And a lot of people said, lucky you. But the thing is, it was like 10 years in the making. And I didn't do it with a concept of saying, oh, one day I want to be on net geo. Well, you can say that. But it happened because I followed my heart and I said, okay, I'm going to learn this and I'm going to learn that. And I learned this about the caves and learn about that, about the caves. And all of a sudden, all of that came into fruition. So learn laterally, not only vertically, put in time, put in passion and put in patience. And don't listen to those that can tell you when are you going to get a real job. Don't listen to that. <laughs> I will agree to that. And I, I've, those of you who watch the sessions I've hosted, you've heard me say this is there's logistics, time, energy, so much that you don't see behind the scenes, whether you're talking about tagging sharks, diving with them, running a cave system and going through like, because now in social media, we post the really cool photo, the final photo, the this, it's, uh, and so people don't realize how much time and energy and effort and equipment and money and knowledge and experience goes into things. So yeah, building all those pieces that you might not think are obvious because you want it now, but they will come in handy and it will come together. And I agree with Christina and that. People might question and say, oh, why don't you get a normal job? What is normal? Uh, follow your heart. You will be so much happier than that normal job or what somebody else decides for you. So um, yeah, very, very important words of wisdom. And thank you guys for all the amazing questions, everyone who joined. And thank you to Christina for sharing your knowledge, your experience, and, and your beautiful sharks with us today. So thank you so much. Um, you guys make sure, you know, there's links on the website. Again, continue to follow her adventures um, because you won't be disappointed, uh, especially if you're interested in cave diving sharks and pit bulls. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Jillian. Bye, guys. Thank